Hey, and welcome to the Origin of Life and Classification Review. My name is Ms. Raybuck, and I'll be leading you through this review today. In a previous uh, session, we talked about the theory of evolution. And the theory of evolution really explains how organisms change over the generations and what guides that change. That's what makes it such an awesome theory. And biologists can understand everything. We can understand why living things have the characteristics they have and how those different characteristics are going to change in future generations. This theory of evolution has this huge explanatory power and that's why it ends up being an underlying theme of much of the, not only our biology class, but the EOC. So today we're going to discuss the leading theories of how life on Earth got started and we're going to look at how we organize all of that life on Earth today. So let's uh, start up here. Let's talk about the origins of life. Again, in a previous review session, we talked about the cell theory. And one of the components of the cell theory states that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Well, why is that? Why can't cells just form on their own if you mix the right molecules together? And the problem is that even the simplest prokaryotic cells, they're just finely tuned organisms. And I have to tell you, organization like that doesn't just pop up on its own. That means every new cell needs to be built on a previous cell. Well, wait a minute. This can't be completely right because you know that life on Earth had to start sometime in the past. And whatever those first cells were, they didn't come from pre-existing cells. So how did the first cells arise? Well, you know what? Nobody really knows. And you know what? We weren't there. We weren't there four billion years ago, and nobody's been able to see it happen since then. Biologists have some hypotheses about that, and that's what we're going to talk about as we move forward. So our early atmosphere. I love these photos because it shows how I envision the Earth. It's hot. It's boiling. It's toxic. There's meteorites everywhere. And so... I really wish that somebody could finally manage to build me a time machine. I wish I could go back 4 billion years ago and see how life first formed. I have to admit to you guys, though, even if I could go back 4 million years ago, or 4, 4 million, excuse me, 4 billion years ago, I wouldn't want to step outside. There's no oxygen. The atmosphere of this very ancient Earth is so different than it is now. There's absolutely no oxygen, and we just have a toxic mixture. We just have methane and hydrogen gas and ammonia. And so you got to be asking yourself, how could life arise out of this toxic mess? These two guys asked themselves the same question and built an experiment to test it. They basically put water into the sterile flask. They boiled it. To it, they added methane, um, ammonia, and hydrogen to simulate what they thought was the composition of the early Earth. They ran it through here with some erupt electrodes that was going to simulate the lightning, and then they condensed it so it would um, form back into liquid droplets. And they ran it through this for about a week, and the results were really amazing. They were able to produce organic molecules like proteins and sugars from the inorganic toxic mess that was our early atmosphere. And so this really suggests to us that these organic compounds that are absolutely necessary for life on Earth could have arisen from simpler compounds in this primitive or ancient Earth. So we have now the the evidence that says, okay, these organic molecules are there. What do we call this now? Well, we're going to call it the primordial soup. This organic mixture in the ocean that formed in the early earth from the building blocks of life. Now, what we think happened is that the right kinds of self-copying molecules somehow got next to the right kind of oil droplets and we got the first prokaryotic cells. These first cells, we think, were the archaebacteria, the ancient bacteria. And the reason that we think it's the ancient bacteria is because these archaea bacteria live in extreme environments just like the early Earth. They even do something called chemosynthesis where they use toxins like methane for fuel. So these bacteria were there. They're using the organic molecules, but you have to remember there's no oxygen at all. So if there's no oxygen, how are they going to make their ATP? 
they have to do it through anaerobic respiration. One of the things that I want you to remember is that anaerobic respiration, there's no oxygen and no mitochondria are needed. It's inefficient, which means it's only producing two ATP. So you have very little energy, which is why the organisms are fairly small. And then you also have these nasty byproducts of lactic acid and alcohol. So change in the atmosphere. Anaerobic respiration produces this carbon dioxide. Um, once a carbon dioxide was around, and I'm talking like a few hundred million years, then other cells could use it to perform photosynthesis. The process of photosynthesis produces free oxygen, which is another molecule that had never been around before. Once we had produced enough oxygen, and the atmosphere started to become a lot more like it is today. The oxygen allowed complex eukaryotic cells to emerge using aerobic respiration, which we know is a very efficient way to break down fuel, 36 ATP. And these eukaryotes can now become more complex and even become forming multicellular organisms until we finally end up with all the varieties of life we see on Earth today. <sighs> okay, that's the whole story of 4 billion years of evolution in what? six minutes. So I think we did pretty good. So you also may be asking yourself a question, well, how did we get from prokaryotic cells to eukaryotic cells? And that's something that we're actually, we're talking about in class now, we're talking about symbiosis. This is a process called endosymbiosis. We know that symbiosis is a relationship, and endosymbiosis is basically how one littler bacteria got eaten by a larger bacteria and you can see that over here in the pictures and both are going to benefit so it's actually another type of mutualism as well so the large cell is going to benefit from the products that the small cell makes such as energy and sugar and the small cell gets a home he gets a stable environment the evidence that we have for endosymbiosis really comes from DNA that gives us concrete evidence. The, the, um, both of these have very similar gene structures. Their DNA is in a loop, like in a plasmid. <clears throat> and so when we look at mitochondria and chloroplasts and bacteria, they have a lot of things in common with their DNA, which is which what leads us to believe that one bacteria ended up engulfing the other. Okay, I'm going to skip that slide. How do we know? You may see something about relative dating or radioactive dating. This is something that you discussed in Earth Space Science last year. Um, just remember that radioactive dating is a way to get an estimate of the age of the material. And we may have to use a reference isotope or what they call an index fossil to help us figure out how old um, the 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 specimen is that we're looking at. Okay, um, we also of course use our fossil record to show us how organisms have a common ancestor and how we can see how long it's taken for organisms to evolve and we can look at observable change such as antibiotic resistance and how that gets passed on to their offspring. Okay, types of evolution. You may also see this not only on the EOC but in the focus questions that you'll be doing for this unit. Convergent evolution is a type, a specific type of evolution. It's when we when we're looking at organisms and we see unrelated organisms coming to resemble each other, like birds have wings and bats have wings and butterflies have wings. Does that mean that they have a common ancestor and they're related? No. Um, those are analogous traits, but they are converging to achieve a goal, which is flight. Um, divergent evolution is a process where related species diverge or break away, diversify, become more different. And this is um, with our homologous traits, we see this like bone structure of a whale fin, um, bird wing, and human arm and wrist. And you can see this in the picture up here. Um, we have a common ancestor, but we've become different. So you can see some of the similarities, but we have since diverged just like the books. Adaptive radiation, this is a lot like um, uh, Darwin's finches that we talked about in class. And this is when species evolve rapidly. Um, they're, you know, the, the Darwin's finches, they migrated. Um, there's a founder effect. And so there's lots of niches to fill. And so they evolve fairly rapidly. 
coevolution is another example or another type of evolution and this uh, is to, has to do with two or more species having a close relationship such that they depend on each other and they evolve together and they by doing that they affect each other's evolution so the flower will evol evolve more dramatic ways to attract the pollinators um, like brighter colors and stronger smells and the pollinators will evolve a way to get better get the pollen or better get the nectar um, they might get longer noses or color vision and so you can see this with a honey creeper in Hawaii you can also see this with your hummingbird picture here on the bottom the bad side of this is that the two species really do depend on each other and if one species population declines then the other is probably going to decline as well because they're just dependent on each other for survival so now we're going to talk about the biodiversity that we can find on, in life today and how do we organize it. So there's so many different species on Earth. Uh, we estimate that there's over 60 million alive today and something like a billion different species that have been around at one time or another um, in the history of life on Earth. And of course, that's way too much for anybody to keep track of. So we have this organizational method and it's called taxonomy. It's our method of sorting all the species into groups. And currently we are using how closely they are related evolutionary wise um, to put them in our uh, phylogenetic trees or in our cladograms. So let's take a look at the domains. We have three domains and those domains are bacteria, archae, and eukarya. And the domains are the most general, least specific, and broadest categories. So in our charts we're going to fill in, we have our domains, bacteria, and we have our domains, archae. Um, under bacteria, you have the kingdom eubacteria. Under the domain archae, you're going to have the kingdom's archae bacteria. Both of these are prokaryotes, which means they have no nucleus. They're doing asexual reproduction. They're unicellular. They're both heterotrophic and autotrophic. Um, believe it or not, bacteria are some of the most abundant um, kingdoms that you will see. Um, bacteria live in all sorts of different habitats, eat every conceivable kind of food, including our archaea bacteria that consume those toxic molecules. Um, and a lot of times because bacteria are so small, we don't really notice the major ways that bacteria help sustain our ecosystems. And believe it or not, without these bacteria, a lot of our nutrient cycles would grind to a halt, not only in our ecosystems, but in us. Uh, remember that the archaea bacteria are the ancient bacteria that you find in volcanic vents, hot springs, hydrothermal vents. They're referred to as ancient because we think these were the first living organisms on Earth. The bacteria domain or the bacteria domain and the eubacteria kingdom, this is where you're going to see your more common bacteria like Salmonella and E. coli. Our domain eukarya is going to include all of these other organisms. So, pro um, bacteria and archaea, those were our prokaryotes, our eukaryote kingdom, their eukaryote kingdom. This is all of our eukaryotes. These are all of the ones that have a nucleus. So these are our protist plants, fungi, and animals. All right. So before I move on and we talk about the eukaryote kingdom, I want to quickly go over King Philip came over for great spaghetti. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Remember that we have domains on the top, and that was um, added fairly recently. So the domain for us is going to be the broadest category. And as we move down, it's going to increase in similarity. But that also means it's going to decrease in numbers. And I'll show you an example of that. I also want you to remember that our scientific name is made out of the last two, the genus and the species. So here's an example. Um, we have the gray wolf, which is one of my favorite animals. He's uh, an, an animal, so he's a eukaryote, right? So we have him in the eukarya kingdom because his cells have a nucleus. And he's in the animal kingdom. From there, we break it down to our phylum. He's a chordate. He has a backbone. He's in the mammalia class because he has the characteristics of a mammal. He's a carnivore because he eats meat. 
um, Canidae and then Canis and Lupus, which is a species. And remember that here is a scientific name which consists of the genus and the species. Now, as you can see, here we have Canis lantrans, and that's our coyote. And so we have the same genus name, but a different species name. This shows me that the coyote and the wolf are related, but they are not the same species, which means that they cannot reproduce and have fertile offspring. So, um, how are living things similar? Um, all living things are made of one or more cells. All living things have DNA. All living things have a cell membrane. All cells have a cytoplasm, and all cells have ribosomes. I have to be completely honest with you. This slide got somehow moved up, and it's really in the wrong area. It was supposed to be at the very end of my presentation. But these are how all living things are similar, which is another question that you might see um, pop up on the EOC. So just take a look at this. Um, it's important for you to know, and we'll do practice with this in class. So here are our four kingdoms, protista, plants, fungi, and animals. Protista, again, you're using this information to fill in your tables. Protista, they're eukaryotic. Uh, they have a nucleus. They do asexual reproduction. They're mostly unicellular. They can form a colony, many cells together, and we see that with algae. It includes green algae. They can be autotrophs or heterotrophs, um, but the big thing is that they have no organs or specialized tissues. Green algae actually used to be classified as a plant and just recently got moved to the protist category. And one of the reasons that they did that is plants are multicellular uh, and they have organs and specialized tissues and algae doesn't have that. Um, they're uh, unicellular, sometimes they live together as a colony and they don't have those organ organs or specialized tissues which is why they reclassified algae as a protist instead of a plant. Um, in the pictures here, you have your amoeba with your pseudopods. These are the fake feet he uses to do endocytosis, bring in large molecules of food. Here we have paramecium, another single-celled organism. And then here we have another protist, and you can see that it has some green to it. So it's our chloroplasts that are doing photosynthesis, and that's one of the ways that we can tell if a protist is doing photosynthesis or not. Here is our plant kingdom. Our plant kingdom is a eukaryotic. It does asexual and sexual reproduction. It's multicellular and sessile. Remember that it stays still. It's an autotroph, which means it makes its own food through photosynthesis. All plant cells have a cell wall. Um, it's made out of cellulose, which is an undigestible carbohydrate. Uh, it's also called fiber. Uh, plants have organs and specialized tissues to transport and move nutrients and water. And it can it's use things that it uses for reproduction, the pollen, the cones, and the flowers that aids in seed dispersal. Fungi are eukaryotic. Uh, they are asexual or sexual reproduction as well. Some are multicellular and some are unicellular like yeast, but all are sessile. Uh, fungi are decomposers, which means they have to break down dead and decaying matter in order to recycle nutrients, which is necessary for a self-sustaining ecosystem. They're completely heterotrophic. Um, and they also have a cell wall that's made out of chitin which is a little softer than the cell wall in plants. So, so far, bacteria have cell walls, um, plants have cell walls, and fungi have cell walls. Last one, Animalia, another animal kingdom. This is our kingdom. We reproduce, for the most part, through sexual reproduction. We're completely multicellular. And guess what? We don't have cell walls. We only have a cell membrane. So, we have only cell membranes, we have distinct organ systems, and most of us are motile, meaning we have a movement or locomotion. Now, here's the end of our presentation, the exception. The exception to the cell theory and the exception to our classification system is a virus. We have no classification for it. It's not a cell. 
Um, and the reason that we don't classify it as a cell and it's not part of the cell theory and it's not in our classification system is that it can't do any of the life functions on its own. It can't reproduce on its own. It can't synthesize organic molecules. It can't excrete waste, grow, or develop. Um, and it can reproduce, but it can't reproduce on its own. It's got to use our cells or other cells to do it. So and that's why a virus is an exception to the cell theory. So that's the end of our presentation. Make sure you got all of your video notes down. If you need to rewind and go back to get some of the stuff to fill in your table, please do that. And remember to study your video sheet for your in-class quiz.